Hello everyone, Mrs. Hensley here. I hope you guys are all doing well. I still miss you guys tremendously and I can't believe that school is almost over. I'm excited to bring you this PowerPoint here on Big Four because you know I'm a lab nerd and we're gonna geek out together on this lab stuff. Big Four is a term that we use in veterinary medicine for a series of four different tests that give us really big information about how our patient's doing. So for today's PowerPoint, what we're gonna be looking at is why would we even run a big four? So indications for that. And then also what are the big four tests? So the components of the big four. Hopefully by the end, you'll be able to describe the steps for performing each of the big four components. Maybe you'll focus on one that you really like, and then you can work with your classmates when we get into the clinic to you know, be the expert on that particular one. And then the last piece is to be able to identify normal and abnormal results of the big four components. So looking at things that we might be alarmed about and things we might wanna tell our veterinary student about right away. So why would we even run a big four? Well, one of the big reasons we run a big four is because we don't have enough blood sample to run a traditional chem and CBC. And so because we don't have enough blood sample, we can just run a big four. So why might we not get enough blood? Well, could be because it was a neonate. And if we look at the word neonate, what does that mean? Neo is looking at new and nate is with birth. So it's a newborn. So a tiny little puppy or kitten, that's more like a potato than an animal, barely get any blood out of it. And we have just a small sample. Another reason might be because it was a cat. Cats tend to be pretty uncooperative and we're trying to do anything, especially get blood. Um, and then another could be because it's uncooperative, which you're like, well, miss, that's that's a cat. Yes, but we could also have a small dog or even a large dog that isn't really thrilled with giving blood. So we may have a, an issue and we only get a small sample from them. Another reason might be because our client can't afford the full chem CBC. And so the big four is a less um, expensive option that we can offer them that will still give us an idea of how the pet's doing and maybe then we just have to find the funds to do a bigger test if the, the big four indicates that. Another reason we often do it is because we have a young animal who's seemingly otherwise healthy that's gonna go undergo a very routine procedure or a fast procedure like a cat neuter. So we may not need to do a big chem CBC on that animal. We can just use the big four and we do that a lot. The last reason that I could think of, and there could be other reasons, but is that our in-house analyzers or our machines, our lab machines aren't working for some reason. So we don't have the ability to run the CBC chem or we just don't have them. So there are some clinics, believe it or not, that don't have that equipment. And so we may have to just run a big four to get a baseline of the animal before we can send out blood work to a reference lab. So the big four is a pretty awesome series of tests. We gain a lot of information on the patient's health from a very small sample of blood. We see how the kidneys are functioning. We can see the level of sugar in the blood. We can check out the hydration status of the patient. And we can also look at the volume of blood cells. So do they have anemia or not? Or do they have other issues with their blood? Um, we can also see severe liver disease and even potential clotting issues when we do a big four. This isn't what we're looking for, but it can be sometimes things that we see um, in, in addition to while we're looking for the other tests. So we'll talk about that when we get to that section in a minute. So what is a big four? A big four is made up of these four different things, although I'll kind of claim there's actually five because people forget about the Buffy coat all the time, um, but the Buffy coat is kind of part of the PCV. Um, so in looking at these four things, I think there are three of them that you can easily identify. So a quick review or a little test yourself. In your notes, uh, I want you to write down what you remember any of these standing for, whatever ones you can remember, see what words you can associate with them. So I'll just give you a minute to do that, just a quick, quick minute to do that. All right, so hopefully you had time to write down a couple at least. Let's take a look. So one is PCV, which is pack cell volume. Buffy coat, I saw what I did there, I accidentally gave you that. BC is Buffy coat. Total solids, total protein. These two terms you will see used interchangeably throughout your time in veterinary medicine, and that's totally fine. 
They are very slightly different. Total protein is when we're looking at plasma under the refractometer. Total solids is when we're looking at serum under the refractometer. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. BG stands for blood glucose. And then azo sticks, I'm sure you've never heard of that one before. I know we didn't get to that in shop before school let out, but um, it gives us a rough estimate of how the kidneys are functioning. It's not a great test, but it will tell us we need to do some more investigation if we have a, a special result there. So what kind of sample do we need for the big four? So I promise I don't have these tester cells throughout the whole thing, just on this little section. So we need anticoagulated blood, we need whole blood. So if we need a sample that has to be unclotted, so it has to contain anticoagulant, what type of tube should we place it in? So again, just quickly in your notes, remember that tubes we identify by their color of their tops. So think about that real quick and which tube would have an anticoagulant in it that we would want a whole blood sample, maybe one we would use for a CBC. All right, hopefully it gave you enough time. So if you remember, we have things like the tiger top tube, the red top tube, and the purple top tube. So the purple top tube is the one that we would use for a CBC and we would also use for our big four. So inside the purple top tube is EDTA, and that's an anticoagulant. Now you wouldn't be 100% wrong if you had picked the blue or the green top tube, because both of them have anticoagulants in them, but those anticoagulants don't have any ability to preserve cells and keep them healthy for any period of time. So we don't like to use them for any routine testing like this for a big four. We also cannot use them for a CBC. So it's always good to have it in a purple top tube because then you can always throw it into the, um, the analyzer if you need to, if you wanna run a CBC. So purple top tube, that's what we need. So just because we stick it in a purple top tube doesn't mean that it cannot clot. It can accidentally clot inside our purple top tube. So we have to be careful when we run our samples check out your tube and make sure that the sample hasn't clotted. How we do this is we rock the tube back and forth and take a look at it and see if we see any visible clots. If we have a clotted sample, we cannot use it, especially for a PCV. The picture I have on the slide isn't, it's actually a serum separator tube, but it's showing that if we put a wooden dowel in the other end of the Q-tip, we can actually see clots stick to the wood, and so we can find clots that way too. It's not okay just to remove the clots because then all of your results are incorrect and because you have little micro clots in there that you can't get out, uh, again, can't get out with a wooden dowel. So how do we prevent clotting? We wanna do an atraumatic blood collection. Now I know you're not in control of the blood collection, but if you see one that's traumatic, so A means without trauma, we know what that means, so we want, a blood collection where we put the needle in, get it into the vein, take the blood out, and that's that. That's that. If you see one that's stressful for the animal, they're poking around a lot using multiple needles, multiple syringes, you might really, really check for clots because you could definitely have a clotted sample. Another way to prevent clotting is to fill the power of the purple top tube all the way to the right level. So if you overfill the tube, you don't have enough EDTA to um, to keep clotting from happening. So, and if you underfill the tube, you're gonna dilute your sample. So you need to be really careful that you fill it right to the right level. You also wanna fill your purple top tube immediately after your blood draw. So we can't let the syringe sit around looking for a purple top tube. We have to have everything ready so we can put it right in there. And then we wanna start gentle rocking of the tube right after we're done filling it. So we wanna start that rocking motion to get the EDTA to mix with the blood so that no clotting happens. I put a double star next to this because it's a little sensitive. Um, whenever possible, um, we want to use the standard two milliliter tube. So they come in all different sizes. We have the little tiny ones um, that only are a half a milliliter, and then we have the ones that take a two milliliter. Now, as a lab person, I really like the bigger ones because we get a much better sample. The little ones are really easy to overfill, so we can put in just a smidge too much blood and then we have clots forming and we can't use the sample. And then with the bigger tube, the cell, cells just stay healthier and we have a better chance of getting the right amount of blood in there. At Tufts at Tech, most people just go and grab the small tubes and they just go with that. Um, but in other clinics, you'll see that most of the time they're gonna use the bigger tubes. It just gives you a better lab sample. 
All right, let's do a quick review of the components of blood. You might remember the lab that we did, it seems like a million years ago with glitter and beads. So we learned then that blood is a mixture made up of blood cells, plasma, white blood cells, and platelets. So very similar, but not at all, to salad dressing, like an Italian salad dressing, where when you shake it up, it's all a homogenous mixture and everything is equally distributed around. But then when you let it sit, or if you put it in a centrifuge, all of the heavy bits go to the bottom, and then the less heavy bits go to the middle, and then the lighter bits go to the top, which is what we see in this picture here. So red blood cells make up almost half um, of the blood volume, and plasma makes up the other half, and a very small fraction in the middle here makes up the white blood cells and the platelets. So this may look familiar to what the PCV winds up looking like because we've taken whole blood and we've spun it down in a centrifuge and the heavy bits are at the bottom and the lighter bits are at the top. So let's look at this quickly if I can. You know how hard it is for me with lab stuff to look at stuff quickly, but let's look at these th different tests. So just a quick review. What are we doing with the PCV total solids in general? We are quantifying or putting a number, a percentage, to the number of red blood cells in the sample. So here we have, you can see this blue line, 100% of our blood sample. And in this case, about 45% is red blood cells, these packed red cells here at the bottom, packed cell volume. Right above that is going to be our Buffy coat, right? Number three here, our Buffy coat, which should be less than 2%. And that's, this is a misnomer. It should say platelets too, because platelets are here in with the white blood cells. If we see a high Buffy coat, it could be that there's an inflam inflammatory or an infectious process going on and there's a lot of white blood cells and that would indicate doing another test. When we look at our total solids, we're used to using the refractometer. We'll look at that again in a second, but we also wanna make sure we evaluate the color and also the turbidity, which means can we see through it or not of the plasma, because that can um, really indicate some disease processes going on. So we quantify that total protein. We also give a, a rough white blood cell percentage. So that is that Buffy coat here. It's very rough. It doesn't give us any calculable numbers. But again, if we see above a 2%, we might be thinking we need to do a complete blood count at that point. So what do we need for equipment? We need our gloves, of course. We need a microhematocrit centrifuge. We need the crit tubes or microhematocrit tubes. We need the clay, which is a brand name of Critiseal. We need a reader card, a refractometer, and then we need glass sides for scoring the tube before we break it. That's something I'm adding on. You may or may not have learned that in shop. And then the saline and um, Kim wipes for cleaning up your refractometer at the end. So here's a nice little picture that I took from Vet Girl on the Run. It's a great website. Unfortunately, it, it does cost money to be a member. I don't have a membership, but you can get some information for free. Um, but if you're ever bored, you can poke around on her site. Here's our fun refractometer with its little crystal right here. Um, here is, of course, our reader card. It goes up to 100%. Our Criticeal, a nice fresh one without little bloody globs in it. And then our uh, hematocrit tubes. These are heparinized. You can see that written on here, and you can also tell by the red bottle. If they're blue, it means they don't have any additive. And what heparinized means is that heparin, which is an anticoagulant, lines the center of the tube, which means you could use it directly from a syringe, um, but we don't really care. It doesn't change our results if we use a heparinized or non-heparinized. And sometimes we have either one in the clinic. It doesn't really matter. So here's our friendly centrifuge, if you remember from school. Um, and so we would place our crit tubes opposing each other. So you need to do at least two for each sample. Sometimes you could do four if you wanted to just do some for fun. And the clay bit, which we'll look at in just a second, again, remember packed at the bottom, goes to the edge. So the clay goes to the edge so that when this spins really, really, really fast, the job of the centrifuge, it throws all the heavy stuff to the end and the clay stops the blood from leaving. This little cover goes on top, you screw it down um, snug but not tight, lower your lid, latch it, and then start it for three to five minutes. I'm not sure, I don't remember the Tufts at Tech one if it's three or five minutes, but it should be written somewhere around or we can always ask the staff members. We'll find out. Okay, so the tube should be filled about three quarters full. I believe this one's a little too full, um, but this one's a little bit better. It depends on how much blood you have too. Um, but then you're gonna place that clay down here at the bottom. And then again, put it in your centrifuge with the clay facing out, not towards the center. 
spin for three to five minutes. And then when you take it out, this is of course what it looks like. And then we're gonna go ahead and read it. Just a little note, this little red piece up here is indicating this is a heparinized tube. If there were no red or if there were a blue line, it would mean it was non-heparinized, just FYI. Okay, so normal results for our PCV, like we said, is 35 to 55%. Buffy coat should be less than 2%. And then our total solids number should be between 6.5 and 8 grams per deciliter. So a low total solid should be reported to your DVM student or to a staff member. It may mean that this pet doesn't go to surgery. So if you get a 4, if you get, oh gosh, a 3 or 3.5, um, that's something that we definitely need to know about. So when we look at the total solids, we're gonna use our refractometer, which is the next slide, but we also wanna make sure that we look at the quality of the plasma. So we should have normal plasma that is colorless to straw in color and completely clear and doesn't have any sort of floaty bits in it in any way. That's what we call normal and you should record that. Lipemia is number two here, which kind of looks like milk, and it actually does have what it has in it is fat, which is why we have the word lipemia, and you can't see through it. So it looks just like milk, and we need to record that as well. What does that mean? Not much more than the animal just had a big meal, but it's definitely something that could change your total solid number, so it's something to definitely record. Number three is hemolysis, and hemolysis, if we take it apart, hemo is blood, lysis is to break down, so it's breaking down the red blood cells, and you can see on number three, it's hard to tell between the packed cell volume and the plasma because there's so many ruptured red blood cells, we're seeing the hemoglobin there. Number four is yellow or ictris, and ictris is when the liver is not functioning correct, correctly. So again, I told you before, we might see some red flags about the liver, this is where we would see it. So you definitely need to note that as the serum color. Uh, as a problem. So not shown here, because I didn't have a good picture that I found online, um, is we can have lipemia actually mixed with hemolysis or ictris. So if we do, it's going to look like a strawberry milkshake. So picture these two guys mixed together. And then if we have ictris mixed with lipemia, we're going to have more of a banana milkshake. I know that's gross, but um, we're going to have yellow and white mixed together. So you just want to record both, that it's lipemic and it's hemolyzed. So just record both for your veterinary student. So when we read the PCV, if you remember, we're going to put up here at 100% the top of our volume of blood, down here the bottom of our volume of blood or the top of the clay. And so we have 100% here. And then we're going to look where the red meets the buffy coat, and that is where we're going to read from. So real quickly, I'm not even gonna play any music, I want you guys to take a quick look and see if you can, and I don't know what your screen looks like, but hopefully you can see it a little bit. What would you guess that this, or what would you say this PCV is? So just give you a quick second to look at it. All right, so if you can see it, hopefully you can see it ends right about here. If we follow this red line up here, we get to the 40%. So this is a 40% PCV, totally within the normal range. We can also barely see on this, on my image, I barely see the buffy coat, which looks to me about 1%. So again, totally within the normal range. Okay, so our total protein. So in the plasma, the primary quote unquote solids are actually proteins. And so we use refractometry to measure the amount of solids that are floating in the plasma. And so it indicates to us a hydration status of the patient. So a high total protein indicates that they're dehydrated. So if you picture like um, a, a, a orange juice, frozen orange juice that you might get in a can, that's dehydrated. It doesn't have enough water in it. So it's thick and syrupy and full of orange pulp. And then you add all the water you need to it and it gets to you hydration. So it gets to a nice distribution of everything and it's not all concentrated. And then a low total protein indicates overhydration. It also indicates some other things, but for our intents and purposes, just think of it that way, overhydration. So we use our refractometer for this. This is where I'll show you when we get back to school how to use a slide if you haven't already done this and use a long sharp edge of it and kind of make a little mark in the hematica tube where you wanna break it. And it just makes it easier and a cleaner break when we do it. 
Um, I have a video that I don't think I'm going to be able to play during the PowerPoint, but I'll put it on Google Classroom of Meg doing a complete um, PCV total solids. She doesn't, she just uses her thumbs, um, but some of you might find it easier to do it the way I, I'll show you when we get back to school. So you use that chem wipe, you kind of just remove the little pieces of glass, you drop a, a drop of your plasma onto the crystal, slowly remove the cover, and then take a look through the eyepiece. And then this is similar to what you'll see, not quite the same. And then you're going to read where it says serum protein. It should be a scale of 0 to 12 or 0 to 14. And that's where you're going to read. Now, this one I'm hoping is actually urine, which is the scale over here, because a 1.6 is not something we like to see for a total solids. Um, so hopefully it's a urine case that we're actually looking at. So then you're just going to go ahead and record that um, on your sheet for your vet student, along with what? along with what it looked like, right? So if it's normal or if it's lipemic or whatever it is. Okay, so this is the video that I want to play for you, but I don't believe I can. I'm gonna try. I cannot. Okay, so I will be on Google Classroom for you and I want you to know what is Meg missing. All right, so let's go on to the blood glucose. Uh, the blood, thanks for sticking with me, by the way. Um, blood glucose is one that you probably haven't done yet. I know you haven't done yet. And in veterinary medicine, we actually use this device called an alpha track two. So back in the day, we didn't have one specifically for veterinary and then they realized we need one. So they developed one. So what do we need to run a blood glucose? We need our whole blood sample. So our purple top tube, gloves, a pipette, and this is a sampling pipette, and then an alpha track two, which is this cute little, comes in this cute little case. And we have several of them in the clinic and we actually have several for the classroom as well. So we use the alpha track too. It's stored in that case like we saw. It comes with the purple reader. It comes with this little bottle that has the test strips in it. And it also has a lancet in it. And the lancet is something that we don't use often for a big four, but we do use it for like serial blood glucoses on a diabetic patient. And if you know anybody, a person who has diabetes, they use them, they put them on their fingers and they it just does a little tiny sharp blade that makes a poke and gets some capillary blood. And then we can use that for these tests as well. Normal range for dogs and cats and people too is 80 to 120 milligrams per deciliter of blood for blood glucose. So a quick, another test yourself real quick. Um, what would high blood sugar be called? So what is the medical term for high blood sugar? And what would low blood sugar be called? So again, I just want you to write it in your notes real quick and we'll look at it together real quick. <laughs> All right, hopefully we remembered hypo and hyper. So a low blood sugar is gonna be hypoglycemia. So glyco is sugar, emia refers to blood. High blood sugar is gonna be hyperglycemia. So again, hyper is too much. Glyco is sugar and emia is blood. So this is just a range, of course. Um, and actually for people, we don't like to see it above 100, to be, to be honest. Um, and slightly higher can be due to stress, and especially in cats. So we can often see cats having a high blood sugar just because of the stress of being in a veterinary clinic, but it shouldn't be much over 120. We could maybe see it to be 130, but when we're getting in the 160, 180 range, we're worried about their blood sugar. Seeing a very low result um, or a high result is also concerning. So this is something you wanna bring to the attention of your vet student or staff member right away. And what I mean by that is we don't just write it on a piece of paper and put it on the pet's cage. When we see something out of range, we should tell somebody because they might wanna do something about it sooner rather than later. So what do we do to use this cute thing? They're actually really fun. I think they're intimidating at first because you don't quite know what you're doing, but I think they're kind of fun to use. It's like a little game. So we have this bottle of test strips. You just take one out and you're gonna put it in butterfly up facing you and these little tiny, we'll look at a better picture in a second, little tiny um, things, wings at the bottom sticking out. You push it in firmly and then a number will appear on your screen. And I've circled here on our little bottle, your number can be for dog or for cat. And it's extremely important that you have the right species. And it's every bottle is different. So you might see a four and a 10 on the bottles. It doesn't, it's not always 35 and 37 you need to look at the bottle that your test strip came out of. Use these M and C keys to go up and down to change the number and make sure that it's the right one. 
So once you change the number, um, and here's a much better picture of the test strip. So this part all goes into the machine. This is where you need to put the blood. Now you don't flood this with blood. You don't just put a huge drop on it. You need the tiniest amount of blood. These machines are meant to actually take a little bleb off of like the ear of a dog that we've used a lancet on. So all you need to do is take your pipette and remove a small sample of blood from your purple top tube. And then of course, recap your sample. You're gonna push the blood to the end of the pipette. So it's just kind of hanging there, ready to, not a drop out, but just kind of making a meniscus. And then you're gonna to touch it just to one of these wings, not to both, just to one of them. I mean, the, when the machine takes enough, it will beep, you take your sample away, and then it will run the test and it will be done almost instantaneously. It just takes a couple of seconds to run this test. So when you get your results, it'll look like this. This one's a little bit high. I do have a video, we'll see if we can watch it. If we can't, I'll put it up on Google Classroom um, and that's what it will look like. So you record your results, you write BG and then a number and milligrams per deciliter. So let's try. Nope, okay, so I'll put that on Google Classroom for you. Azo sticks, this one is perhaps the easiest and most fun to run. So azo is actually a prefix, probably not one we've covered, but it means nitrogen. And so blood urea nitrogen is a, or BUN, which you may have heard from the chemistry, is a waste product that is filtered out by the kidneys. So an, if an animal has a high level of, a B, of BUN, it indicates renal dysfunction, which is the medical term for kidney dysfunction or kidneys not working correctly. This is known as azotemia. So again, we have azo meaning um, nitrogen and emia meaning blood. So azo sticks give us a very rough estimate of the amount of BUN in the blood sample, and therefore a very rough estimate of the kidney's function. Now it's not a great test, but if we get a high reading on this, then it's something we wanna investigate more with doing a chemistry and, other blood, and probably other blood work. So what do we need to run one? Well, of course we need the azo stick bottle. We need a whole blood sample, not surprising, a pipette, gloves, distilled water, paper towel, and a lab timer. So when we run the big four, these serial tests like this, that same pipette we just used for the blood glucose, we're gonna use it for the azo stick, you know, conserving supplies and protecting the environment and everything. So how do we do this? So this is just like sort of the urinalysis. So if you remember the urinalysis test strip, the giant strip with all these little pads on it, if you have a fish tank or a swimming pool, it's the same kind of thing that you dip into the pool or to the fish tank to see what the pH is. So it's an indicator pad on these little test strips that come in the bottle. So wearing gloves, you wanna remove the cap and take out a strip one at a time. This shows you three for some reason. And then using your pipette, you're gonna have a small amount of blood. You need one to two drops um, to cover this reagent pad and then immediately start your timer. So this one works best with a buddy that they can start the timer for you for 60 seconds. After 60 seconds, all you need is your bottle of distilled water, not tap water, to rinse it off completely. And then you compare the color that you see on the strip to the colors on the bottle. Now, the internet does not have a lot of azoistic pictures out there, so I wasn't able to find a good picture of the different colors and the results that they are, and I don't um, happen to know them off the top of my head. Um, so you just read the color that matches the best to the well, what the bottle says it is. And you record that in the um, on the piece of paper that has all of your other recordings. And that, my friends, is the big four. So in summary, the big four is routinely done as a health screen for young animals or when only a small amount of blood sample is obtained or when a chem and CBC are not available for whatever reason. So whether the machines are down or the clients just don't want to do it that day. Um, performing a big four is actually kind of fun. I hope you can see that as we went through it. I know you know I'm a lab nerd, but I really do think they're kind of fun. They're also simple tests and they can be done by a veterinary assistant. Um, and that can someday, sometimes be the role of the assistant is to work in the lab and do those sorts of things. So the big four includes those tests we talked about throughout this PowerPoint, the PCV total solids, of course, with the Buffy coat added on, the BG and the Asa stick. And big four results give us an indication of kidney function, blood counts, hydration status, blood sugar levels, and the homeostatic state status of the patient. All right, that's all I have for this PowerPoint. I hope that it was clear and made sense. 
If you have any questions at all, please make sure you email me and then I can go over anything in particular with everybody or just maybe with you, depending on how it is. And I will post the two videos I have on Google Classroom. Feel free to take a look at those. And I hope you guys have an awesome week.